The right kind of faith. We got to have the right kind of faith. Psalms 1-1, that's where I'm going to begin. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The word blessed here means happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. In fact, when you say you're blessed or you say to somebody else, you're blessed or I'm blessed, you're saying I'm happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. And the Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. If you don't hang out, here's what it means. If you don't hang out, take advice or settle down with folks who have missed the mark, who are not following God, then you are blessed. But if you do, you will not be blessed. Now that doesn't mean everything. Like if you know someone that's not saved, that knows a car is good or not, you could take that advice. We're talking about anything that goes against or contradicts the scriptures. That's what we're talking about. Anything. People go, you know, Christians, they go to secular counselors all the time, and I, I'm always wondering why. And I know in our city it's hard, because I, I know one counseling group that claims to be Christian, they, 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 I, I, years ago I just wouldn't have anything to do with them because they, were, they, they weren't just counseling in a Christian manner, even though they called themselves that. But what I'm saying is, as we walk and live in life, we don't hang out. We don't take advice or settle down with folks who are against God, who mock God. And if you don't, then you are blessed. But if you do, you will not be blessed. It sets a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. And so where does faith come from? How do we get faith to be blessed? What is faith? For instance, a lot of, some people say, well, I, I, I just don't like this faith stuff. Well, you can't please God without this faith stuff. I mean, that's only Bible, by the way. And in, in, in fact, everything we do with God is by faith. We, we, we get saved by faith. We forgive by faith. We receive forgiveness by faith. We get filled with the Holy Spirit by faith. We give our money by faith. We serve by faith, believing that God will reward us, that God will bless us if we honor him and do what he says, do what he asks, he commands. And so faith is a part of our whole journey and people that aren't even saved have faith, the wrong kind of faith. They have faith in the world and the world system. And, and, it's, and it's a misplaced faith, but the only way to get faith in God is through his word. You can't get it any other way. So faith is not merely belief in the absence of evidence, nor is it blind trust. Instead, it is a deliberate choice to align ourselves with God's will guided by his word. It's a refusal to listen to those who discredit or ridicule God, choosing instead to follow the path laid out by God's word. This is the difference of, of those who are blessed and those who are not blessed. I even think some of the news that people watch shouldn't watch, because they mock God, they discredit God. And, and I, I quit watching the news, I don't watch any of it. And their local news, they're not very honest. And people say, well, why do you say that? Because it's true. You know, the, 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 they, they never really report the facts. They, they go after dumb stories instead of the real stories. And, they, and they, they're so afraid to tell, you know, like the governor, they're so afraid to tell her she's wrong. They just don't say anything. But let a church stand up and do something, and oh, then they got a big mouth. And even though they lie most of the time, they don't tell the whole story. We, I don't have any faith in them. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, we need to come to a place where we put our faith in the word of God and everything that we hear or see should go through the filter of what does the Bible say? What does God's word say? And so and when you go on and read verses two and three, and it talks about the people who are blessed in Psalms 1-1 are those who delight in the law of the Lord meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, yielding fruit in season and not withering when challenges come. In other words, you know, by some translations say they don't cast their fruit off before it's time. But a better translation has said they're yielding their fruit in season and not withering 
when challenges come. When we have faith in God, when we're blessed, we don't wither. We don't fall apart when challenges come. They may cause concern, pause, we may be a little afraid, but we keep moving forward with God's word because we are blessed. Happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. See, this is a direct outcome of their faith, which is shown in their deliberate choice to not walk in the counsel of the wicked. You can't live in both worlds because you either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. In other words, you have to decide as Christians and believers whose advice we're going to take. Over the last couple years when I refused to take all the COVID advice, most people in our church, they, they liked it. A lot of people didn't, though. They said, well, we got to believe them. we got to believe them. we got to believe them. My faith wasn't in them. My faith stayed in the Word of God, and that's where our faith should stay. And I learned then that people know what they believe sometimes, but not why they believe it. Because all through the Scriptures, God says, don't be afraid. And yet, let one thing happen in our lifetime that is a little wacky, and we, we become fearful. We, we become afraid. And, and, and I know there'll be moments when we will be afraid, but we never let the spirit of fear rule and direct our steps. Like if you jump out at me, you know, I might be a little afraid for a moment. If I'm walking in a place that's sketchy, I might have a little bit of trepidation and, and, and be afraid a little bit because, and, and, and you'll be aware. But, but folks, we don't have to live with fear. And so we, if we're gonna have faith, we must learn what it is and how it comes. Romans 10, 17 from the New King James Version says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, the only way to get faith in God, the God of the Bible, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is through this word. You can't get faith through Oprah and Dr. Phil. You, faith doesn't come that way. Faith only comes from the word of God. You, you believe it or you don't. But the more you hear it, the more you hear it, and the more you hear it, and 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 hear it, then faith will come. You just don't hear it one time. You got to hear it, and hear it, and hear it. We got to stay in the Word. And so you can't just manufacture faith. It's birthed out of an encounter with God's Word. It's like you hear it, and something clicks inside of us, then we begin to act on it. This is how faith comes in no other way. I don't know how many t people over the years I've been doing this have come up to me and said, I don't know why we didn't start tithing earlier. And I'll just listen to them. They said, man, here's, since we've been tithing, here's what God's done for us. Da, 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 da. But we, but, and, and then I think, well, we should just hear it and act on it. You should hear the word and act on it. And whether you understand it or not is not relevant. Because understanding will come as you begin to act on it. And no matter how much you know about the Bible, there's still a whole bunch more to know. But faith in God, faith in his word comes from hearing. You can't manufacture it. And, and when, you, when you hear it and hear it, then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off. And, 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 and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I get it now. So they begin to act on it. But we need to understand how it comes. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to walk with God and please him, for whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. If you're going to have faith, because it's impossible to please God without faith, but if you have faith, we must believe that God is real and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Now, I've heard this over the years. I've had so many people say, you don't serve God for the rewards, do you? Yes, I do. And people say, oh, that's not right. I don't serve God for any, any rewards. I'm like, really? And can I tell you what that is? It's a false humility. It's not, it's not from God. Because if you, if you have faith and you believe that God exists, you must believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Amen. I don't know what all the rewards are. Some will be on earth, some will be in heaven. But he says you must believe this. 
And people who say, well, I only serve God because it's the thing to do. I don't care about the rewards. I don't even believe there are any rewards. I, I'm like, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? See, so many people have such false humility. It's called pride. And it's called arrogance. Well, I don't want to bother God because, you know, oh, he's got bigger things to deal with. My things aren't that big. That, that is not... That is not healthy. It's not biblical. It's ungodliness. And people say, well, I think it's being kind. No, what you're saying is God is so small, he can only handle so much at one time. He is not like us. We, people say, I can only handle this. I can't handle it anymore. God handles it all. He's God. He's not like us. We need to become more like him. The word diligent means to zealously seek for something with all of one's heart, strength, and might. Go to any length to find God and obey his word. If you are diligently seeking God, if you are diligently looking for God and seeking him, then you zealously seek for something with all of your heart, your strength, and your might, and you'll go to any length to find it. That's what it means to diligently seek him. It's not a passive seeking. It's not being apathetic. It's not saying, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. That is not biblical either. You say, it's not? Find me a scripture where it says, if God wants to have it happen, here's what my Bible says, pray so God can move on the earth. That's why we gotta pray. That's why you gotta pray all the time. God gave the, the deed, the title to the earth to man. Man gave it to the devil. So now God, when he, that's why he wants us to pray without ceasing. So he can come and we give him permission to move. And I know that might freak some people out. He doesn't need permission. Let me tell you something. God says you don't have because you don't ask. Or let me put it this way. He said, even though he knows what you have need of, you need to ask him. We deal with a God of this world called the devil. The Bible calls him the God of this world, this world systems. And he's an enemy, but we shouldn't be so focused on him because he's a defeated enemy. He's, he, mo, some people get so big, what's the devil doing? What's God doing? Because whatever God's doing is bigger than what the devil's doing. But he needs us to pray. He needs us to believe God. He knows what I, we have need of. He knows what legacy has need of. But he still wants us to do something and pray and believe him. In other words, he's always wanting us to be in a spirit of faith that trusts God no matter what. No matter what we see, we trust him. Faith isn't some fuzzy feeling. It's knowing that even when life doesn't make sense, God's word stands strong. It stands firm no matter what. Romans 12, 3 talks about get God giving us a measure of faith. Faith is not self-generated. It it's a gift, not just any gift. It's like the best kind of heart transplant you could ever have in the world. You get a new heart capable of trusting God in a way you never thought possible. When you become born again by faith, we believe that Jesus came and died on this earth and was raised again from the dead. We believe it by faith. You say, why? Because we weren't there. We didn't see it. I didn't see it happen. We took communion tonight by faith, remembering that his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. I took that by faith, believing that God's gonna heal me and God forgives my sins. I believe it. I've never seen Jesus. One day, hopefully, I will in a few more years. But we need to understand that God gives us this gift, this measure of faith. And it's a gift, and it comes with a new heart. And what it does is it allows us, when you're born again, when you truly ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, and you begin to follow him, he gives us the ability to begin to trust him. People who aren't saved don't trust God. But we as believers should trust him. 
And faith is trusting in God regardless of what I see or feel. Faith isn't just about believing right. It's about living right. It's choosing every day to trust God's way over the world's way, the wicked's way. And when you do that, you're blessed. What does that mean? You're happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. I love that. I, years ago when I looked up, I just love that. Because now when people say, Pastor, you're so blessed, I said, I know. I'm happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. What's wrong with that? Well, you're being arrogant. See, folks, we never want to give God all the credit. We, 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 God blesses us, and we're afraid to tell people because what will they think? How sad are the church? I think if you're blessed, I want to know because I want to rejoice with you. I, I truly do. I want, to, I want to rejoice with you. If you're honoring God with your tithes and offerings and you're honoring God with your service and you have the biggest house in Albuquerque, I am for you. Why? Because it's none of my business what God blesses you with. And if you're blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable, who am I to naysay that? And folks, let me tell you about people who do that. When you naysay those kind of things and blessings in others, when you don't rejoice with those who rejoice, here's what you're saying. You're saying, God, I want none of that ever in my life. That's what you're saying. There's no other way to say it. And I'm like, I, 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 you know, I don't need a lot of things. I don't want a lot of things anymore. But I'm grateful that God has blessed me with what I have. And I think we all need to be grateful and brag on God sometimes. Not that he needs it, but people need to hear us say, God is a good God. How come you have that big house when the world says that? Because I am blessed. I'm happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. Why do you drive that car? Because I'm blessed. Why do you wear those clothes? Because I am blessed. Before those of you who say I'm blessed, but you don't honor God with your money, you're not as blessed as you think you are. Woo there we go. But we are state champions, just so you know. When problems come, when things go wrong, it gets tough. Faith doesn't back down. It stands on the promises of God and continues to believe. Promises like God is with you. He's your strength. He will never leave or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And I know we get discouraged. You can be discouraged for a moment, a day, a minute, but you shouldn't stay discouraged longer than that. Why? Because the Bible's constantly saying, the reason God says that is because we as people tend to get discouraged when we can't see everything. When we're believing him, that's what happened to the children of Israel when he led them out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt. And, and, and he says, they left for 40 years, their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. I mean, there was miracles happening every day. And they still wouldn't trust God. When they went to the promised land, two spies said, let's go, let's go kill them. We can kill them all. Ten, though, riled up the people and said, we can't do it. Let me tell you something. Be careful and beware of the so-called Christian who always says you can't or you don't need those things. You know, for the longest time when I got here, you know, we started growing. People say, I don't know why you need another building. I don't know why you need another campus. I don't know why you need that. I didn't, I didn't know what I know today back then. But you know what I should have said to them? Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. You say, Pastor, that's rugged. No, because the Spirit of God from the Holy Spirit who believes in God would say, if that's what God wants us to do, we should go climb that mountain. We should go kill, you know, destroy those people. We should go take our promised land. And why can all the other things in our world have big and nice and whatever and let the church begin to do that and then people balk. I don't know what that church is. I remember years ago we got some limos donated to us from a funeral home. French's funeral home called me and he said, hey, you guys want these? We're getting new ones. I said, absolutely, we'll take them. You know what we did with them? We picked up older people. They loved it. We'd, people would drive and go pick up older people that couldn't drive and they were like, man, I get to ride in a limo. 
Do you know what went around town? I, I remember someone telling me this lady was going to come here. And she goes, I won't come there. The pastor, he drives around in a limo and people drive him around. I'm like, I had never even been in those limos. <laughs> but you know what? And if I did, so what? Maybe it was safer for you for me not to drive. It would have been better for me because I would have never had to get mad at people driving in the left lane that should be driving in the right lane. Come on, somebody. But we will face times and moments of discouragement. We don't stay there because we believe in God that he's never leaving us or forsake us. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Folks, these are words for us today. I believe this. Isaiah 12, 2, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. You see, we need faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why you got to come to church. That's why you got to hear the word. And you got to be careful who you listen to. You know, the Bible is so clear in the last days, men will heap up teachers on themselves. And, and what it means is teacher after teacher after teacher having itching ears. And folks, there's people that are on TV today that are, you, we, we, let me, how do I say it? How, 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 how do we not think those people aren't alive today? They have a form of godliness, but they're, but they're far from God. I could name some. They, they, they're, they're not godly. They, in fact, they teach the opposite of the word of God. They, they teach what mockers and scoffers do. And my Bible says, stay away from them. But we act like everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. Even some of the Christian singing artists. They, you know, there's one lady out there that everybody seems to like. And she, she, she's gone into the secular world now. But, but she, she, Lauren Daigle, she, she said... <laughs> Listen to me. They asked her on national television about homosexuality, and she said, that's above my pay grade. Let me say something to you. As a Christian, nothing is above a pay grade. But, but when you only want to be popular in a world, you got to be careful. And if you, if you just listened to her songs and didn't know she was a Christian, it doesn't say much about God or Jesus in any of them. We've got to come back to truth. And I'm not dogging her. Right? She is what she is. But what I'm saying is, folks, we, we need to understand that not everybody who says they're a believer is a believer. And they don't all have the right heart. And so if you're listening to somebody and they say, well, this is what they said, and it's not lining up with the scriptures, then you shouldn't listen to it. It doesn't matter if I teach. I, I, I say a lot. You know, don't take my word. Go back and study this out for yourself. I don't know everything. But I'm telling you, we're coming to a place where the church has to have greater discernment and know who's with us and who's not. And when you have preachers out there preaching, don't listen to the Old Testament at all. all my Bible says all the word of God is inspired by God. All this is inspired. And, and so are you telling me we can't learn from the Old Testament? I learn a ton from the Old Testament. It, it's amazing what we will learn if we'll just get in the word. Now, I'm not the corrector of the body of Christ, so I don't ever want to be propped up that way. But at least I can listen to something and say, that is not God. That is not biblical. And there's guys that I, I listen to that some things they say I don't agree with, and I think we need to be as smart as an old cow. You say, what does that mean? Eat the hay and leave the sticks. Now, I didn't call anybody a cow. I know someone's going to get mad and say, you called me a cow. No. I said, we need to be as smart as an old cow. We need to learn to eat the hay and, and, and leave the sticks, but we need to know what the sticks are. Because not everybody's going to be perfect, and, and not, nobody is. But at least if we can back it up scripturally, we can stay on that. And, and people want new revelations. I, I haven't even gotten through the old revelations. I mean, I, I don't know everything, but we're looking for something new, but we're not even doing what's already here. We should just be founded on truth and know that God is with us. It, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're feeling, God is with you. Faith is not about a fuzzy feeling. It's about what you believe. 
And I don't know how many things we've been through, my wife and I in this church, and we keep believing. And God always comes through. Why? Because faith pleases God. Without faith, you cannot please him. And if you're going to have faith that pleases him, you must believe he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So God is with you no matter what. Yeah, but I blew it. He's still with you. I messed up. He's still with you. I made a bad decision. He's still with you. He doesn't ever forsake you. You may forsake him, but he doesn't forsake you. So what is faith? It's the core of a life that's truly blessed. It's a heart change that comes when you are born again. It's learning God's word, believing it, acting on it. That's what faith does. Faith believes the word of God and acts on it. You know, you either have the God kind of faith or the demon kind of faith. Which one, which one would you prefer? How many want God kind of faith? How many want the demon kind of faith? I don't. Can I tell you what the demon kind of faith is? In James 2, 19, it reads, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the devils or the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now, you're not saved by deeds. You're not saved by works. We're saved by the grace and mercy of God. It's a gift. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it. But once you're saved, you are saved to do good works. And he's saying, if you say you have faith and there's no deeds, there's no goodness, you're not doing anything, he says, man, even the devils have that. I've never heard anybody say it like that. You either have the God kind of faith which believes and acts, or you have the demon kind of faith which believes and just hopes and is terrified. We have to be doers of the word. Yeah, but preacher, I make a lot of mistakes. We'll be a doer of the word and repent a lot until you get your things right. God will help you. He's not, don't be discouraged. He didn't leave you. Well, I've been messing up for years. That's okay. It just takes a moment of time to come back and start walking with God again. And when we hear the word, we may not understand it all. I don't but I do it anyway. I don't know how God does what he does. I don't know how I give my tithe way back in the day and my wife was like, and my wife and I are like, we're gonna tithe. And then we're wondering how we're gonna pay our bills and somehow we always did. I don't know how God did it, but he did it. And sometimes, sometimes he did it by giving me other jobs. But today, you know, if you work over 35 hours, oh, woe with me. Because we listen to the world. Why don't we listen to God? You should work it from sunup to sundown. Well, that's too much. I won't have quality time with my family. I guess God didn't know that. I, I guess he didn't understand that we need quality time. And most people that have ever said that to me, staff people and everything, they, when we start talking to their family, they're like, he or she, they don't spend any time. They, when he comes home, he gets video games. And so we need to understand that you're not overworked if you work 35 hours or you work 40 or 45 and then God gives you another job, a part-time job or another opportunity. I, I don't know why we think, I, and, and folks, because I'd rather be dependent on God than this crazy government. Now, don't get me wrong. It's the best constitution in the history of the world. But there are a bunch of people messing it up. And then they're asking us to do and believe things that are wrong. I mean, president, I, I want to call the guy that they call president. He gets up on Easter and says, all of America, would you help us and, you know, support the transgender movement? No. You know, because here's what the Bible says. They're offending these kids. They're offending them. And it's better to tie a millstone around your neck and drown yourself in the sea than offend one of these little... They, they're offending our children. If a five-year-old says, a little boy says, I think I'm a girl, you know what your, your dad should say or mom? You are not a girl. You're a boy. You're, you're a boy. And in that, we should end it. But when you have a reprobate mind or a mind that's taking counsel from the world, you'll think it's okay. 
You know, a while back I, I said in our church, if you're a boy, you're, you, you're born a boy, I don't care what you've had done to yourself, you will go in the boy's bathroom. If you're a girl, you're born a girl, you will go in the girl's bathroom. I said that one day and a lady gets up right over here, walks in that aisle, goes down the middle aisle and flips me off for saying that. And then is shocked when she got booted out of our church. Now she could come and repent any time, but she hasn't. And I'm just saying, guys, why do, we, why do we freak out over that stuff? God is not in the gender business. He made two sexes, male and female. That's it. There's no other. Well, pastor, you know, they say, and I know you got workplace and you got the craziness of that. But folks, for a president of our country to ask people on Easter Sunday, and then they made all the excuses they want. He could have waited to the next day and said something. But oh no, the arrogance. Because the church world goes, oh well. When the Roe versus Wade thing was overturned, we celebrated. Do you know there was a bunch of churches that wouldn't say a word about it? That even told their pastors, don't say a word about it. Why? Because they're offended. They're, they're afraid they'll offend their crowd and the crowd won't show up anymore. That's the problem with going to a church that's a crowd instead of a church that's the church. So we have to be people of faith. We have to go to the Word. What does the Bible say? Just because culture says it. We can't take our counsel from them. We cannot. We, we need to be the adults in the room and tell our kids this is what men do and this is what girls do. I don't know why it's so difficult. And when I say it, it's so controversial because that we live in New Mexico. If I said this in Texas, they'd say, please, man, we all believe that. Not everybody, but most people. But what I'm saying is when you have faith in God, you, you, you're not concerned about those things. You, you deal with them. You, you, you confront them. You, you hold the, what you believe. And, 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 then, and if, the, the, if people get upset, then let them get, maybe they need to. Maybe it'll start them thinking and give God an opportunity to deal with their hearts and minds. Maybe what the world has been telling me is not true. And the world is always going to be anti-God. We got to be pro-God. We have to be pro-faith. So let's, be, let's purpose to be people of faith. How? In our decision making. The way we live our lives. We honor God's word over any advice the world, the wicked, would give. We purpose to be doers of the word, not hearers only. That's how we become people of faith. Well, preacher, I don't understand it. I don't either, but if you, if you can read it, just start doing it. And understanding will come. You either have the God kind of faith that, that believes and acts, or you have the demon kind of faith who believes in who Jesus is, but doesn't choose to ever act on his word. They're not doers of the word. They don't believe it. So let's choose the God kind of faith and be truly blessed because that's how it works. We, we learn this word and we, we start having faith in it. I believe it. I believe it even when I make mistakes because it convicts my heart. Anybody ever hear sin and it made you feel bad? That's how you know you're born again. When I was a sinner, I sinned. I never felt bad a day. I, I never, all the things I did, I never felt bad. But once I got born again, it started changing my life. And it can change your life. I'm no different than you folks. I, people say, well, you're a pastor. That's, no, I have to believe it the same way. I know preachers in the pulpit that don't even really believe the Bible, but they have a good job. But in this house, we believe the word. We stand on the word. We're going to fight for the word. We're going we're to contend for it. But that's what the Bible teaches us. Faith is about trusting God's word even when we don't understand. When the culture's screaming at us, we still believe the word of God. When we have problems and issues, whether they're self-inflicted or things just happen, we believe that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Well, how can you believe that? Because the Bible says he wouldn't. That's why I read those scriptures. We don't have to live afraid all the time. And God can teach us if, we're, if we have ears to hear. 
Years ago when I was a kid, I was about 17, I went out with my buddies and I was drinking and I got drunk. I drove home and about the time I got home, my dad, who was at the VFW, drove home and he was drunk and he got home about the same time. And he started getting on me about drinking and here he was, and my, as my mom said it, here's one drunk telling another drunk not to drink and drive. But what happened in that moment, as I look back on it and reflect on it, I believe God was always trying to get my attention. And so he was getting on me and I got mad and I was being stupid. My dad was a big dude and he would fight you in two seconds. I mean, at 40 years old, when I'm 18, my dad's over in his mid 40s and he comes home and he's mad. And I said, what are you mad at? And he goes, I got in a fight. I'm like, what? He was a great pinochle player, and one day they, play, most of the time they just played, him and his buddies played at the military thing, and, and he was great at it, and they played for some money one time, and he, they caught this guy cheating. Well, my dad just didn't say, you're cheating. He hit him, <laughs> punched him right in the mouth. And I'm like, and I'm, here I'm a young man, I'm like, wow, my dad not messing around. But I challenged him as a man, and I threw my keys at him and said, here's your and I used a, a word, keys. Well, my mom and my brother, who I probably owe my brother, Pastor Troy, because he's told me many times I saved your life that night. My dad, within a second, was right here. I challenged him as a man, and he wasn't going to have that. And my mom was, his name was Harold. My mom was like, Harold, don't do it, don't do it. My brother jumped in and said, Dad, don't, don't hurt, don't do it. He was going to whoop me right then and there. I probably deserved it. I mean, it was a second. He was right here. I was so out of it. I was just standing there like a dummy. I should have ran. I know he couldn't have caught me. (laughs) I'd have came home later when he calmed down. But what happened after that broke my heart. To this day, it affects me when I think about it. I disrespected him in his house. I said something I should have never said. I challenged him as a man. And I'm grateful he just didn't get a hold of me and just treat me like a man. He'd have whipped me so bad. It'd have been, uh, it'd have been ugly. Thank God for a mom and a younger brother that, as they said, saved my life that night. Yep. And so what happened, though, was after that, he wouldn't talk to me. I'd say, hey, Dad, I'm going to go out. And he'd just, he just wouldn't acknowledge that I even spoke to him. Or he'd say, I don't care what you do. And this went on for a few weeks and it broke my heart. I loved my dad. And I, you know, there was no God in our family. My mom believed in God, but we didn't. But I just felt bad that I I, I did that and he wouldn't talk to me. So after a couple weeks, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. He was out in the backyard in our house in Clovis and he, uh, he was leaning against the pole. He, was, he grilled steaks all the time. His favorite was a porterhouse steak. And he was out there grilling it. And I just said, I can't do this. I, I wasn't talking to God, just myself. I said, I can't. I can't. I can't. This is too hard. I love my dad. So I went out there and leaned against another pole. He wouldn't even acknowledge that I came out there. It was just both of us out there. And I finally looked with tears in my eyes and said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I should have never done that. I'm, please, I'm, I'm sorry. And I'll never forget his response. He looked at me and said, okay. That was it. From that day to the day he died, he never brought it up again. Not one time did he bring it up. Not one time did he say, Steve, you almost died that night. Not one time. <laughs> he never mentioned it ever, ever again. And then when I look back on it, now that I'm saved and born again, I'm like, that's how God is. He, he's not going to bring it back up. Once you say, God, forgive me, I, I'll, I'll do better. I'll try to do better. He's like, okay. And we move on. It's not a license to sin. It's just, it's just the heart of God. And I think as I look back, when I got saved, I look back to that moment. I think, God, you were trying to tell me who you were through a dad that wasn't even born again. I wasn't even born again. But as I reflect on the story, it's like, okay. That's probably why I can go to God and repent all the time because I know he's going to say, 
Okay, Steve, let's just keep walking. Try to do better. But for a dad that wasn't even saved, never, never once brought it up again. Because I, I respected him enough to say, Dad, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have did that. And he was big enough as a man to say, okay. That's all he wanted was an apology. He wanted me to honor and respect him. He could have kicked me out of the house, but he didn't. He could have taken my car away, but he didn't. But he didn't care. He wouldn't even talk to me. Folks, when you walk away from God, he's always there if we'll ever just turn back. My dad didn't forsake me in the natural. He didn't kick me out of the house. God's not trying to kick you out. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to bless you. That's the God we serve. That's the God I have faith in and I trust. Now I'm asking you to do the same. If you're here tonight, wherever you're watching from, and you say, preacher, I've walked with God, but I've walked away. You're right. I'm just ready to tell him, I'm sorry. Forgive me, God. I'll repent. I'll, I'll do better. I'll try to do better. And God will say, okay, let's just keep walking. If you're here and you need to get your life right, this is your moment. Because God will never leave you nor forsake you. But if you want to have a relationship with him, you must do it his way. And for some of you here, you've never given Jesus your life. You've never made Jesus Lord of your life. You've said, oh, I prayed a prayer. I'm saved. Well, wait a minute. Salvation is a byproduct of lordship. And unless you say yes to him as Lord of your life, you, you're not saved. So today, tonight, right now, with every head bowed, and you say, preacher, would you include me in your prayer? I'm ready to say yes to the Lord. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to make him Lord of my life, give him permission to lead and guide my life. If that's you in Jesus' name, all over this room, wherever you're seated, I'm going to pray with you right at your seat. But I want to know who I'm praying for. But more importantly, I want you to be able to say, God, I don't care what anybody thinks or says. Right now in this moment, I'm going to diligently seek you. And you, if you do, you'll find him. If you call upon the name of the Lord, he'll answer you. It doesn't matter what you've done or how much you've done. You just got to look and say, God, forgive me. And he'll say, okay. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you see it, are you ready? In Jesus' name, no hesitation. Say, preacher, include me in your prayer right at your seat. Would you please just lift your hand all over this place? Is there anybody here? By the lifting of your hand, thank you. God bless 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 you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you up there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you over here. Thank you so much. God, God loves you. God bless you. You'll never experience the love of God until you say yes. Thank you so much. God bless you. I'm going to look across the top one more time. Anybody else? It says, preacher, include me in your prayer. Thank you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you over here. Thank you so much. I'm just looking across the top. Who else? Anybody else in the top section? Thank you, sir. I got you. Thank you. I'm bottom section. Anybody else want to join these? We're all going to pray together. Thank you. I see your hand waving at me. God loves people. Thank you. God cares. That's what I was trying to say. And he says, man, you must believe I, I'm real and that I reward those who diligently seek. And he is right now. He'll bless your life. You'll get a new heart and you'll have the ability to trust, be able to trust God in a greater way. Anybody else? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for all the hands that were raised in this house. And I'm so grateful, God, that we are a church that we're real, we're authentic, we're not trying to put on airs. I love the people that I work with and the coaches that coach the kids. I, I just, I admire them. And I love their heart. They may not do things the way everybody thinks or say, whatever, but God, they love our kids and they love you. So I'm asking that you bless this house and all those who said yes to you tonight, may you show yourself strong in their behalf that they would come to know you and know your ways. In Jesus' name, if you lifted your hand, I'm going to ask that you pray this prayer aloud with me 
right where you're seated, loud enough for your ears to hear your, your own voice. I want everybody in here that's right with God to, to join in in support of those who lifted their hand and pray with them. And for anyone in here, that maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you need to get your life right. God's for you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you pray, God, I choose to believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he's your only son. And I believe you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So with my heart, I choose to believe. And now with my mouth, I willingly confess, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I choose you, God. Thank you for choosing me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church.